It's now time for our scripture reading. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles or look up on your phone, however you're going to look up the scripture this morning. Uh, our scripture is from Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. And I'm going to read just the first four verses, I think, the pastor asked me to read. So Matthew 13, verses 1 through 4. And I'm reading out of the, um, the um, Holman Christian Study Bible. It says, On that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat, sat down, while the whole crowd stood on the shore. And he, he got in the boat while yeah, well, the whole crowd stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and ate them up. I'm just going to read the whole thing. Others fell around the mucky ground where there wasn't much soil, and there they sprang up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. Still others fell on good ground and produced a crop, some 100, some 60, and some 30 times what was sown. May the Lord add a blessing to his word this morning. Um, let us uh, bow our heads as we open God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you for, the, uh, for your wonderful word. Um, Lord, uh, we need ears to hear and hearts to understand um, because uh, we have, have uh, so much going on in our lives that uh, sometimes uh, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to sit down and listen to you. So uh, we know that you're here today by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the title of my sermon this morning is Good Dirt. How many of you guys ate dirt when you were little? <laughs> you, you are much more honest than my other church. Um, <laughs> when I asked that question to the other church, I think the only one that raised their hands was my wife. So... <laughs> But you guys are much more honest. I, I, I think uh, that uh, when, you know, when we were little, there was just something about dirt. You know, We wanted to see what it tasted like. And of course, our moms freaked out when we did it. But here we are anyway. You know, there's some good things about eating dirt. They, they say that kids that, that uh, can go outside and play in the dirt and uh, get dirty and uh, uh, that they actually have better immune systems after they get older, isn't there? Is that, have you guys heard that? Uh, that they have less allergies, uh, less inflammation to uh, environmental things. So, hey, hey, eating dirt, you know, it's got its advantages, right? Um, I learned a few things about dirt um, as I was studying for this sermon. Did you know there are 70,000 different types of soil in the United States? How about that? 70,000 different, 70, different types of soil. How would you like to be the guy that went around and counted all the soil in the United States? Oh, hey, 70,000. One tablespoon of soil has more organisms in it than there are people on earth. One tablespoon of soil. More organisms within that than there are people on earth. 500 minimum years it takes to form one inch of topsoil. That's why it's so important to have, have a good topsoil and, uh, if you're going to grow a garden. Uh, 5,000 different types of bacteria in one gram of soil. 0.01% of earth's water is held in soil. 15 tons of dry soil per acre that pass through one earthworm each year. How about that? That's a lot of worm poop, isn't it? <laughs> 15,000 tons of dry soil per acre that pass through one earthworm each year. Um, 1,400,000 thousand earthworms can be found in an acre of cropland. That's a lot of worms. God must love worms, I think, you know, because, you know, when worms, uh, when worms get done with dirt, it's, it's good dirt when worms get done with it. 20,000 pounds of total living material in the top six inches of an acre of soil. 
10% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions are stored in soil. 4,000 gallons of water needed, uh, soil needs to produce one bushel of corn. 11,000 gallons of water uh, that soil needs to produce one bushel of wheat. This is just some interesting things about soil that I found out. Uh, some fun facts about dirt, if you will. I remember when we moved here from, from Indiana <clears throat> to Arizona, um, in Indiana, of course, my mom, we always had a garden, and uh, in Indiana, it was very easy to grow things. Uh, you just had to kind of tickle the soil a little bit, throw in some seeds, and boy, you had zucchini squash the size of, uh, of, a, you know, of a, small, uh, a small donkey. So, um, <laughs> and you had to try to get rid of it, you know, because <laughs> everybody had zucchini that size, so. Uh, and then we moved back down to, uh, we moved to uh, Arizona, and uh, it was one fine day in the month of May, and school was out, and, and so my mom said, Jay, uh, why don't you go out and, uh, and uh, plow us up some ground for, to, to have a garden? And uh, we lived down on, uh, uh, just across the, the street here, uh, back when there wasn't anything around here but Thunderbird Academy and just a few, few houses and, and horse ranches and so forth. And uh, so she said, go out and take the rotor tiller and, and uh, work on a garden for us. And so I, I took the rotor tiller out to the backyard and we had a, a, an acre at that time. And I thought, well, here's a good spot. I'll just start here. And so I fired up the old rotor tiller and, and uh, amazing thing, it wasn't like Indiana. The soil was not like, it was like, more like cement. And so the rotor tiller was just bouncing on the top of, the, of this earth. And I thought, this is not, never going to work. And so I went in and talked to my mom. And I said, you know, this, this dirt here is it's more like cement. And she says, oh, you're just not trying hard enough. Go out there, you know. And because uh, she was Scotch-Irish and, and uh, there was nothing that couldn't be done if you put enough elbow grease in it to a Scotch-Irish lady. And... Uh, and so I, I went out and, 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 and the, the rotor tiller was just bouncing off the top. And so, so finally I, 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 uh, I figured out that if I got the hose and I sprayed the ground, let it soak in for a little while, and then I could go out and, and, and I could rotor tiller up about an inch. And then I had to spray it again and I'd go out and rotor tiller up an inch. So instead of, you know, 45 minutes, it took me three days you know, to uh, plant the garden, and by then it was almost uh, June. So it's time to plant the garden in June, right? So uh, you go out and you put the seed in the ground, and you, know, you water the seed, and boy, it pops up really quickly because it's nice and warm outside. And then by that time, it's almost July. And what happens to nice little green seedlings in July in the wonderful state of Arizona? Yeah, we found out that uh, gardening in Arizona was a little bit different. Um, eventually, we did figure it out. Water and soil are really important to, a, to a, a good garden. I want to talk about that a little bit uh, this morning. Um, Jesus used the analogy of growing things quite a bit to explain some of the most important things in the kingdom of, of heaven. Um, in the plan of salvation, in the kingdom of heaven, in the way that God does things. So we want to talk about a parable of Jesus this morning. Remember that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? Earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's what a parable is. And so Jesus told this parable in Matthew 13. It says, on the same day, uh, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood at the shore. Can you picture this in your mind? People crowding to Jesus, wanting to hear what he had to say, desiring to, to listen to the gracious words that came out of his mouth. And so many people were crowded around that Jesus backed up a little bit, a little bit more, and backed up a little bit more until there wasn't any room to back up because he was... And so he said to Peter, Peter, let me borrow your boat just for a little bit. And, and uh, Peter said, climb in, Lord. And so Jesus climbed in the boat and sat there on the boat and spoke to the people. It says in the... In the Desire of Ages, I love this, uh, in uh, Desire of Ages, page 244, it says, What a scene this was for angels to contemplate. 
their glorious commander, sitting in a fisherman's boat, swayed to and fro by the restless waves, and proclaiming the good news of salvation to the listening throng that were pressing down to the water's edge. He who was the honored of heaven was declaring the great things of his kingdom in the open air to the common people. I just love that. Jesus, the commander, condescending to sit in a little boat and talk to sinners like you and me. You know, uh, the gospel is all about good news. It's, it's, it's easy to understand. It may be hard to live, but it's easy to understand. Jesus made it easy to understand. The Bible says the common people heard Jesus gladly. Common people. I believe that God loves common people. And I'm thankful that he does. Jesus' greatest lessons were given to common people. And that's a lesson to you and me. Don't think that God overlooks you because there isn't something special about you. God doesn't overlook anybody. He loves common people. He gave his best stories and spoke his best parables. And the deepest things of salvation God gave to common people. Just like you and me. He loves each one of us as though there were not another person in the world. So to God, you are not common. You are not common. You're special to him. So Jesus continued uh, uh, on telling this story in Matthew. Uh, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. That's Arizona July gardening right there. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on the good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then Jesus ended this story by shouting to whoever would listen, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. How are your ears today? How are your ears today? Mine are a little bit clogged up. I've had that same disease that, that Miguel and maybe some of you have had, and, and I'm mostly over it. I'm 95% recovered, but my ears are, are a little bit plugged up still, so it comes in real handy when my wife is telling me to go do something. You know, It's like, what? What? Yeah, that only, uh, that only works you know, for so long. We often use the phrase, uh, are you hearing me? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Have you ever heard anybody say that or use that? Are you hearing? Yeah, sometimes we say, yeah, bro, I hear you. I hear you. What does that mean when we say, I hear you? Does that just mean that, that we're, we're the physical act of listening or does it mean more? It means more. It means I am understanding you. When someone says, I hear you, I hear what you're saying, that means they understand what you're saying. They, they know what, what, the, what the deeper meaning of your words are. And Jesus is saying to us, if you have ears, listen, understand the deeper meaning, the deeper message behind what I'm saying. Um, he who has ears to hear. The, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, you know, we're studying through Revelation in the Sabbath school lesson, and uh, in chapter 2 and verse 7, Jesus says to us, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So when Jesus said to the crowd that was listening and heard this parable, he who has ears to let him hear, he really was saying, Listen to what I'm saying. Let the Holy Spirit come in and teach you what I'm saying because the Holy Spirit's job is to take the words of Christ and to, to enable us to be able to understand them because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We're not naturally spiritual people. We're not naturally able to understand the things that God wants us to understand. We need the Holy Spirit to, to speak to our hearts to help us to understand what Jesus wants to say to us. And so Jesus says, whoever has ears, let them them hear to what the spirit what the spirit is saying to the churches i want ears this morning do you i want to hear what the, what the what the what the holy spirit is teaching me is trying to tell me i want to hear what jesus uh, wants to tell me today because if i can hear and understand what jesus says to me then i know 
then I will know what God's will is for my life. One of the many things that the Holy Spirit does is it takes the word of God and applies it to our hearts. When God speaks, when God has something important to tell us. And he wants us to listen to it, to pay attention to it. It's the Holy Spirit's job to to bring in our hearts that conviction, that conviction that what we're hearing that what we're hearing is from God. It's God's word. And, and when the Holy Spirit brings that conviction to our heart, it awakens our heart so that we can respond to God spiritually. It, it, it breathes life into that, into that soil of our heart. It breathes water and, and nutrients it, so that the seed that God puts in can actually grow. Because after all, when we're talking about soil, we're really talking about our hearts and our ability to understand what God is saying to us. And we can ignore the Spirit. We can reject the Spirit. We can fight with the conviction that, that God is, is giving us. Or we can accept it. We can believe it. And we can apply it. And we can obey it. And when we do that, then we receive the blessing that God intended us to give when He plants seed in our hearts. We, we are blessed from accepting, believing, and obeying God's Word. So when God's Word comes to you, when God's Word comes to you, say, Lord, give me ears to hear. It's the Spirit that speaks to your heart. Jesus uh, quoted the, the prophet Isaiah in, in between the giving of this parable and the interpretation of this parable that he gave to his disciples uh, sometime uh, later, Jesus quoted the prophet Isaiah uh, to drive home the point of this parable because after all, the whole point of the parable is what kind of soil does God find when he plants the word, when he plants the seed of the word? What kind of receptiveness, what type of heart he is hearing the word that Jesus is giving us. And Jesus told this, this parable, or this uh, quoted this from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He said, for this people's heart has become calloused. What does it mean to, to have a callous? A callous is a hard place. It's an unfeeling place. Fortunately, we have some calluses on the bottom of your feet. You know, when you, when you were a kid and you ran around barefooted outside all the time and you grew these thick calluses on your feet so that if you kept, stepped on that occasional pebble, now if I go outside and walk around, I never hardly ever go barefoot. So if I go outside and walk around, I say like, ow, 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 because I've lost all the calluses on my feet. But a callus is a thick place in your skin, right? It's a thick, hardened place that, that doesn't feel, and, 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 and it, it's, it's tough. It's a little harder for those goat heads out there to, to go through a callus than it is for, for it to go through a nice, tender place. So we don't want a heart that's calloused. We don't want a hardened, thickened heart that's, that's not tender, that's not receptive. But Jesus said, for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they, they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. What does it mean to turn? To turn means to be converted. It means to be born again. It means to be convicted and to respond. It means I was walking this way away from God and now I'm going to turn and walk this way back toward God. And Jesus said that these people, their, their hearts are hard, their hearts are calloused. They don't see spiritually and they're not hearing spiritually because if they did, they would, they would turn around and they would, come forward, they would come toward me instead of going away from me. You know, Jesus, uh, he, t he told one of his hardest parables, one of the hardest things that Jesus said was when he, uh, when, he, when, he, when he talked about uh, you know, eating my flesh and drinking my blood. He said, if, the, if, if you want to be part of me, then you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood because whoever doesn't do that has no part with me. And, and when people heard that, they said, this is a hard saying. Who, who can hear it? It's a hard saying. Who can hear it? 
And the Bible says from at that point in time, many people, many of his disciples turned around and walked no more with him. They walked away from him. You know, uh, I want to give a little Bible study within the Bible study uh, today. Um, this might be sound a little bit controversial, controversial, but I want to I want to uh, uh, just tell you this morning that God does not condemn us for our sins. God does not condemn us for our sins. We are accepted by God or condemned by God according to our response to the gospel. God does not condemn us for our sins. We are condemned when we reject the gospel. We are accepted when we accept the gospel. Um, let me show you a few texts uh, just quickly about that. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? All have sinned. Sin, uh, the sin in our lives is not up for debate. You have sinned. I have sinned. We all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. But listen, what Jesus said, he illustrated in John chapter 8 and verse 11. When the woman was caught in adultery and came to Jesus, and they caught him in the very act, she was caught in sin. In the, in the, there was no question. There was no arguing. It was open, it was, it was what it was. And she expected condemnation from the rabbi. What does she get from Jesus? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus did not condemn her for her sins. She does, he does not condemn you and I for our sins. Listen, for the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's John 3.17. You know, a lot of times we, we love John 3.16. We, we, everybody knows it. But, the, but an important verse is John 3.17. The Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. But that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him, John 3.18, is not condemned. Where does condemnation come from? Where does, where does acceptance come from? It comes from believing in the gospel, accepting the gospel. Condemnation comes. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Where does condemnation come from? It comes from our rejection of the gospel. The Bible says when we accept the, the gospel... There is therefore now, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We are accepted and we are, or we are condemned according to our re reception of the gospel. How many of you have uh, felt condemned by God? Have you ever felt condemned by God? Is that a... Is that a good feeling? To feel like you're under the condemnation of God? Let me, uh, I got a text for you. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. If you ever feel, felt condemned, if you feel like you're under God's condemnation, condemnation, the Bible says, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. God is greater than our heart. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. You know, I've, I've strayed a little bit now from our parable. Let's get back to the meaning of the parable of the sower. We find that in, uh, in Matthew chapter 13 and verses 19 through 23. Jesus said, if anybody hears the word of the kingdom, what is the seed that the sower goes to sow? It's the word of the kingdom. It's the good news of the gospel. Who's the sower? It's Jesus Christ himself. 
If anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives a seed by the wayside. But he who receives a seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. I want to make a couple of points in closing. A farmer plants a crop really for only one reason, to reap a harvest. That's the only reason that a, a farmer sows. He wants to reap a harvest. The sower sows his seed for one reason. He wants it to bear fruit. He needs it to bear fruit. In this parable, Jesus is sowing the seed of the gospel. He wants the gospel to bear fruit in the lives of those who hear his word. But here's the second point that I, that I want to make. It's the condition of the soil that determines whether or not the seed will bear fruit. It's the condition of the soil that determines whether or not the seed will bear fruit. Because after all, we're not really talking about dirt here, are we? We're talking about human hearts. We're talking about the ability to hear what God is saying to us and respond in a positive way. Soil represents the human hearts. This whole story is about God wanting to share the good news of the gospel with us and describing our response. Our response. How's your heart this morning? How's the dirt in your heart? Because <laughs> it's the condition of the soil that will determine whether or not the gospel will bear fruit. Some people's hearts are so hard and calloused that the gospel seed just bounces right off. They don't care. They don't believe. They have no need of God. Religion is just a crutch for the weak. It's an opiate of the masses. The thought of Jesus dying on the cross for their sins doesn't move them doesn't affect them in any way. They don't feel their need of a Savior and the gospel seed just bounces right off of them. Some people hear the gospel, they accept it, but find out that there's a cost to, to receiving the gospel. There, there is a cost. It's free, but there's a cost. There's a cross that comes with it. It's not always easy to be a Christian. Jesus said, if you want to be one of my disciples, take up your cross daily and follow me. And some people figure out, man, that cross, I, you know, it, it's really nice what Jesus has done, but, but taking up that cross every single day, I just, I can't do it. It's too, it's, it's too much. It's too hard. Following Jesus can sometimes be hard or, or painful. And some people want the easy way, the pain-free way, the cross-free way way and so the the gospel springs up but it doesn't take any root and they they fall away and there's a really dangerous one i think for all of us uh, folks living in 2019 uh, some people intend to be good disciples they they want to follow jesus but they get so busy they get so busy doing things and and, 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 and surviving and, 
and you know there's so many activities there's so many requirements of, of our society that 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 the things of the spirit and the things of the gospel just kind of kind of uh, sometimes take a back seat and there's you know the kids have this activity and I know it's sabbath but you know the kids need to you know uh, you know we want to go uh, and all of a sudden all of a sudden life happens and life will set your priorities for you if you don't set priorities for your life. And eventually church and worship and, and God and become, become secondary instead of primary. We've all seen these, these types of things, haven't we? We've all seen these. We've seen all of these things, but... We've seen these types of soil in others, but what about ourselves? What about ourselves? Um, truth be told, all four of these soil conditions have existed, or do exist, I should say, in my heart at the same time. All four of these soil conditions have been my experience at, at, at some point or another. There are times when I am convicted by something in God's Word, but, but that conviction comes up against something that I like. And so I reject that conviction. There's been times when, when God has said, you know, Jay, I, this is what I need for you. This is what I want for you. And I have said, no, God, that 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 thing that toy that that desire it's mine and i'm not going to give it up stay out of that room god uh, don't don't open that closet god you can have the rest of the of the house but that closet that's mine don't go in there and the gospel seed bounces off There's been times when God has told me to love someone or help someone and, and I've hardened my heart and refused and done what I wanted to do or what I felt like doing. There's been times when I have wanted to do God, God's will, but, but it got too hard and I quit. Or I got tired or lazy or scared or didn't trust God for courage or strength and, and I started well but didn't in so well. And yes, there's been times when I've gotten so busy and put other priorities in front of spiritual things in my life. But God's call to me for my ears, for my heart is seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you as well. If I don't set that as a priority in my life, then my life will set other priorities for me. Seek ye first. I know that as a fact, but I haven't always lived it. I have had all three of those soil conditions in my heart at one time or another. I put myself and my wants and my needs before God. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like dirt. You guys ever felt like dirt? You know, when we lived in Texas, um, there was this uh, radio show that I that I heard. Um, um, that I used to listen to. Um, early Sunday morning, on my way to work as an emergency room nurse, he came on early Sunday morning, I guess that was the, that was the time, that was the time of, uh, of uh, for garden shows in Texas. <laughs> and the guy's name was Howard Garrett. He's still on the air, I think. And people would call in and say, you know, Howard, my tomatoes, I just can't get my tomatoes to grow. And he would say, well, what you need to do is uh, get a cup of uh, Epsom salts 
and dig around your tomatoes and put in that Epsom salts around your tomatoes and, and water it in real good. And, and uh, cause our soil around here needs that, that, that Epsom salts. And I tried it and I'll tell you, it works. You can grow good tomatoes in Texas. <laughs> Or they would say, you know, my, my fruit tree, it just, you know, the, the, uh, you know the, and he would say, well, what you need to do is go down to the bait shop and get you some earthworms. And get, get three or four things of earthworms and dig up around the, the tree and, and put those worms in the dirt. And uh, it won't happen right away, but pretty soon, after those worms do their thing in the dirt, that dirt will get better and better and, and the soil will improve. And the tree will, will grow. And I tried that on my little, my little uh, tangerine tree when I lived out where Zach and Alicia live right now. And that tree is, it was nearly dead when we moved in there, brother. So, so every time you pick a tangerine off there, you thank Pastor Jay because <laughs> I'm the one that dug around that tree and put the earthworms in and, and then put some manure and some good stuff on top of it. And now that tree has got the best tangerines on campus, except for Bob's. Bob's are better. <laughs> but people would call in and, 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 and they would say, well, it's the soil, it's the soil. It, and he would say, it's the soil, the soil. You've got to improve the soil. When you improve the soil, you improve the fruit. You know what they called him? His name of the radio show was The Dirt Doctor. That was his, that was his name. Because, uh, because when you improve the soil, you improve the fruit. <laughs> um, the Dirt Doctor says, any soil can be approved if you use my methods. If you use my methods. <laughs> uh, Jesus is a dirt doctor brothers and sisters. He can improve your soil if you allow him. He can take hard, calloused soil and he can soften it. He can add the things that will make that soil receptive to seed and he can improve it if you'll let him. Even the hardest soil, the dirt doctor, our heavenly dirt doctor can improve it. Rocky soil. We got plenty of rocks. We got rocks to spare in Arizona. Too bad we can't export rocks in Arizona. We'd be, all be millionaires. Jesus can take even rocky soil that, that, that doesn't have much topsoil and he can, he can help us to, if we will let him, he will remove those, those stones and, and, and he will improve the soil so that, so that the gospel can sink deep into our hearts. For you uh, busy Christians, the dirt doctor can even improve you. He can, he can take those weeds out of, our, out of our lives that will choke the fruit. He can take those things that if we will let him, if we will let him, Jesus can improve the soil of, his, of our hearts so that we can bear fruit for him. You know, uh, the dirt doctor's, one of his prescriptions is found in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will give them good soil. Is that what you want? If it is, uh, pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, if we are honest, we uh, confess to you that, uh, that our hearts have resembled all of those types of soil at one time or another. Sometimes, Lord, we've been hardened against your, your will. Sometimes we've, we've been just uh, too afraid or too... Uh, too too uh, lazy, whatever it might be, Lord, and, and the seed has just uh, gone to waste on us. Uh, sometimes we get so busy, Lord, that our priorities are wrong. But Lord, what we want is that deep, rich, nourished soil 
in our hearts that will grow the seed of your word, that will grow and, and mature into the fruit-bearing Christians that you want us to be. Lord, forgive us for our poor soil. Be the dirt doctor for us, Lord, that improves us and makes us receptive because we want to bear fruit for you. Lord, this church wants to bear fruit for you. Please, Lord, do what only you can do in our hearts. And we thank you and give you all the thanks and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen.